Welcome in, guys. This is the Cover 5 Podcast. I am your host. You can find me over on Twitter at DFS. As always, I'm joined by my co-host at ILOFF over on the Twitter. Welcome to the Week 18, pretty much preseason slate, and then a few teams that are just playing their starters against bad teams in matchups where you'll probably see some uh, onslaught stacks and a bunch of different things happening this weekend. There's teams that are playing for something. There's teams that are playing for nothing. And me and Hilo will be breaking down our five favorite games for this weekend. Hilo, how do you go about like just thought process on this Week 18 slate? I think it starts with embracing uncertainty where the field is not. There's a couple of offenses that I think that is most pertinent to that we're going to talk about today. Um, The field is going to be extremely drawn to the perceived certainty of like, we know these backups are going to be playing a lot. So that's like your Jordan Masons. That's like your Cedric Tillman's. That's like these, these guys that have not, necessarily shown a ton at the professional level but they're going to get playing time and we know um with a high degree of certainty that they will get that playing time this week Mm -hmm. then you have like the other side of the coin where it's like dan campbell has said that he's gonna treat this like any old game but the lions players are not expected to garner a ton of ownership like what if they just play the whole game because they still have an outside chance at the number two seed what if the Dallas Cowboys hang a 45 burger on the um, on the Washington Commanders again? And what if they play the whole game? Because like they should have last season's Week 17 game where they came in flat against the same Commanders team um, and got blown out like 26 to three or six or something, something crazy. Um, so like I don't know, like what <laughs> embracing the uncertainty in on offenses that we know to be good on primary nfl caliber talent um in ways that the field is not is kind of how i'm viewing this slate so it's kind of like i view this slate as kind of like a a a game theorists perfect slate because it's just riddled with uncertainty the field is trying to place their bets on perceived certainty and i can just go like bet on good players on good teams when the field isn't like that just sounds like a good deal i'm gonna do that that makes a lot of sense, but let's kick it off. Let's go to our first uh, matchup. You are taking the NFC East game between the Philadelphia Eagles traveling to New York to take on the Giants. How are you playing this specific game? Um, it's going to be with Philadelphia, and this is another spot where there's a lot going on behind the scenes. We have Devonte Smith, who picked up an ankle injury, left the field on crutches and a walking boot. Probably not going to play regardless. But then you have A.J. Brown in a, I don't want to place a label on it, but some people are calling it like a diva hissy fit um, for the second time this season where he's like, I need the ball more. Um, He's not wrong, but it's also a function of some outside pressure ownership fans like being placed on on Sirianni is like, you should run the football. And he's like, so they tried to run the football against the Cardinals and they lost (laughs) dropped from the one seed to the, to the five seed. So does there's just a lot of uncertainty, but playing against a giants team that we know runs a lot of man coverage. They run a lot of cover three. We know they blitz a lot and we know they don't necessarily hit home a lot. That is the most beautiful matchup we could ask for, for one AJ Brown. And so like, if he plays three quarters, if he plays an entire game, we don't know. Um, the Eagles would be smarter, potentially, depending on how you land on this whole situation, this whole discussion of do we sit players, do we maintain our momentum? Well, their momentum is shit to begin with, so yep. like, <laughs> I, I don't know. The, the point here is like we don't know what we don't know, and we have to accept that to be able to see the spots where we can still capture upside where the field isn't. The fact that this game is in the afternoon portion of the slate kind of amplifies that, makes people more uncomfortable to uh, to go to Philadelphia players. So, I mean, if you build a shell with like on the main slate, it's and it's it's more important this discussion to um, leverage this upside on the main slate as opposed to saying, well, I can just wait until the afternoon slate when we get more information. It's like, yeah, so can everybody else. So, like, build some Eagles like Jalen Hurts plus uh, A.J. Brown throwing another player if you want. And that gives you a lot of flexibility still with the amount of salary that you've allocated to that 
to move off to one of these other late games or, um, or, you know, ride with it. If, if my, if I build a shell and I have, we'll say four out of my nine players on the early slate on the early, early portion of the slate. And it's very interesting too, because like half the games are in the early portion and half of them are in the later portion. So if I build like a, a shell, half of my players, four out of nine are in the early portion and they all smash. Well, now I'm in a position where I don't necessarily have to take that risk, but depending on like the projected ownership of Eagles, I might still roll that risk because again, first place is all that matters. And this one slate can make your, the next five seasons. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting game theory stance to take on the Eagles this week. Cause we know they're a good offense. We know they can put up points. We know AJ Brown is good at football. We know Jalen Hurts is good at football. We're not betting on Jordan Mason or Cedric Tillman or um, Rashad Bateman. We're we're placing our bets on like solid NFL talent and a solid NFL offense coached by a solid NFL coach. Um, and we're just embracing the uncertainty of we don't know how much the field. We don't know how much playing time the the primary skill position players are going to get. So. Um, yeah, you can play it just a, a, a three man onslaught from the Eagles. You can add a bring back because the Giants players are cheap. Um, it's just a good spot, I think, to take a leveraged gamble this week. Yeah, and the last time that AJ Brown complained about not getting the ball enough, it was week two against Minnesota Vikings. Yeah, after he received records. six targets, and then the next week he had 14 targets, 131, then 175 and two, and just so on and so on. Went for like a six week stretch of over. 125 which is the uh the nfl record so aj yeah. brown in this matchup is spo- he's supposed to smash like let's just he is supposed to go out there and against a man coverage look against a rookie corner who's really really good deontay banks is one of the better corners from this past year's draft and has played extremely well physically aj brown should be able to win this matchup and then aj or jalen hurts in this offense like they they have to find something like yeah. they can't there's no identity. They they don't have one this year. They don't have one going into the playoffs. And it's it's week 18. Like they I think the idea of like, well, if they see the Cowboys blowing out the commanders, like they're just gonna, you know, stop getting all their guys. Like I disagree. Like, if they're gonna play in this football game, well, they need to just establish themselves. It's it's yeah. not about it, yes, winning the division's cool. Yes, yeah, seeing the Cowboys. Being up big on the commanders would obviously make it like a, hey, at halftime, how are we going to treat this and probably pull their starters if it's a really bad game in Dallas. But at the end of the day, in that first half, when they're going all cylinders, like you can't play football half speed. If Mm -hmm. you do, that's when injuries happen. That's when bad things, you know, transpire. So if the Eagles are going out there, I think that A.J. Brown and company, it might only be two to three drives like but AJ Brown somehow gets to 130 and two because of it. Like he's capable of having all these explosive plays against this look. It's just a matter of getting it done. So I do love AJ Brown here. And with Tyrod uh, playing, I believe he was he on the injury report. No, I think he's he there. was limited, uh, limited both practices. Yeah. I think to start the week. I didn't but see today's with with Tyrod on the uh, regardless with Tyrod at quarterback. I have interest in all the pass catchers. Tyrod doesn't want to take hits and he wants to launch it. Like it's awesome watching him play it similar to what Joe Flacco is doing, who they used to be teammates over in Baltimore. Um, yeah. It's not as good because Joe Flacco has obviously been dominant. And Tyrod plays for the Giants. It's a little bit different there, but Darius Slate and Jalen Hyatt, Wandale Robinson, no problem playing any of them. Um, if I'm playing AJ Brown, Wandale obviously is the lowest upside play, but Darius Slate, and we both said it last week, it's like the go route against the Rams. Like they're, they're going to give it up. The Eagles corners can't defend it either. They haven't been able to figure out anything. And Tyrod Taylor came in at halftime and threw like a 70 yard bomb to Darius Slayton. So like it wouldn't surprise me if they get him going. And then also you just play Jalen Hyatt a full route tree, right? Like it's the last week of the season. It's your rookie. I would think, man, you'd assume. So I'm hoping he gets out there, but that's all I really have to add there. I remember they ran outside zone with for one play with DeAndre Swift and it was really cool against the Giants. And then they yeah. just didn't run it. <laughs> um, I hope they run that. I don't. I hate Swift's usage from a. He never gets the one yard line touch, so it's mm-hmm. like why even bother? 
but I do like DeAndre Swift as a player, and I think he could he could have a good game on the ground, but his price is just not something I'm going to get to uh, this particular week. So yes, Devonta, I agree. Devonta Smith was literally ruled out while you were speaking. So perfect. So AJ Brown, AJ Brown's going to get like if he plays the first half, he's still going to get seven targets. Yeah, like if Maybe AJ more. Hurts, yeah, if Jalen Hurts throws the ball eighteen times, he's getting seven. Like I can't imagine he gets any like fewer than that but anywho that's all i have to add about this game um not much not really interested in tyra don't hate it um but obviously not gonna love it just because of the rest of the slate there's a quarterback in particular that i'll talk about in a little bit that i will be playing at a high rate but moving forward minnesota vikings playing the detroit lions the detroit lions are coming off of the Really upsetting game. Obviously, Dan Campbell's very passionate man. And that yeah. I can't believe he went for it after all the penalties. It was just <laughs> wild to watch. The second but, time was egregious. The yeah. third time, okay, but <laughs> whatever. He's committed. But regardless, <laughs> this is a game where he's been preaching about this whole like we're gonna play our guys. Like, if they do, they're gonna be able to put up points against the Minnesota Vikings, who are not playing for anything. But it's a spot where like, why? Like, at, at a certain point, it becomes a question of what are you really accomplishing right now? Um, the Detroit Lions, to me, are a team, they're going to come out and fight. Like, they're going to be very aggressive early on in the game. And the Vikings are kind of in a standpoint of, like, we don't have our quarter. Like, we don't have a good quarterback. We keep playing this carousel there. Like, who are we playing for? Who are we, you know, trying to get into? Um, like, who are we trying to develop? And for me, I'm hoping that's Jordan Addison. I hope that's a, this is a game for him to kind of be utilized a lot more. I know Nick Mullins is playing quarterback because they just keep switching it around. But for me, Justin Jefferson, like, what's your big motivation here? Like, what's the thing that's like, other than playing football, you're you're not playing for a postseason berth. I believe they're eliminated, correct? No, they can still get in, but they need a win like, and three losses. They need a loss by the Packers. They need a loss by the Seahawks, and they need a loss by the Saints. I mean, I guess that's very viable, but still, it's not a spot for me where Justin Jefferson's like, like he should be must have against Detroit Lions normally. But with Nick Mullins, I'm fearful of that guy putting him in harm's way. Like it's as crazy as it sounds. Happened once. It's happened twice. It's just they yeah. missed the other time. <laughs> like he's he's put them in bad spots. But regardless, like it's a game where there's a lot of uncertainty. I think if you pick Lions players, their top guys, you just game stack it because that's the way it goes. If if it's going to be a shootout, it's going to be a shootout. I personally think the Lions are going to treat this the way the Packers did against them a few years back where Aaron Rodgers played in week 18 with like Devonte Adams and all of them. And they played till halftime and like Rodgers had like 180 and two touchdowns at halftime. And I was watching them like this, this dude's really just going to go out here and play his guys. Huh? Like Devonte Adams had like four catches. Alan Lazard had like seven for 90 at halftime or something crazy. And I think the Detroit Lions will play it like that where the first half they're going to get their guys. And then the second half, they're just going to let their backups play. But that's just me guessing and not necessarily uh, this way I'm going to play it. Uh, as far as Minnesota goes, again, I don't think you want to run the ball against Detroit. Their run defense is really well or really good. Obviously, if they get to their backups like Ty Chandler can break one. Um, I think this is a game for me where I like Jordan Addison over Jay Jettas. How are you treating this one? I think this is a very interesting game for many correlations. Um, pick a Detroit Lions player, and I want Justin Jefferson on the other side. Um, you yeah. look at his last three games, even you know, as they're it, nothing oh, changed over the last. Three. You don't you don't take the fourth game where he got absolutely <laughs> shut down because they doubled him. You loser. Yeah, well, Come I on. mean that that was a different situation. <laughs> the Lions don't do that. Uh, um, that's fair. They could. I mean, the, yeah. the Lions don't do that. I mean, they're because that would mean they have they can't blitz as much, and they're not going to do that. That's <laughs> so, true. Um, I don't know. I you look at the last three games, like Justin Jefferson, ten targets each game. The there has been only two players that have seen s over six targets. Um, Jordan Addison saw six in one game over the last three game stretch, put up over hundred yards and two scores in it, but. Um, the only two players to see seven targets um, 
over the last three games were Johnny Munt and uh, KJ Osborne. It's like, okay, if that is the state of this team right now, I'm just going to place my money on Justin Jefferson. Um, Jordan Addison is a legitimate NFL caliber pro ready wide receiver. He was one of my favorite wide receivers coming out of this class. I thought he landed in a perfect landing spot for his skill set, but a lot of his route tree is over the middle of the field routes. And that is right into the only strength of this uh, Detroit defense in rookie slot corner, converted safety, whatever you want to call him. um, Nickel Brian Burns. So Brian Ranch. Brian Burns Branch, sorry. Panthers. Come on. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. There you let's go. talk Bama, about Bama guy. I absolutely love Brian Branch. I do yeah. agree that he's he's been he's made a lot of plays. He's also getting beaten quite a bit. It's weird. It's a weird thing with it. I mean, he's a rookie safety that's playing nickel. Like, yeah. I also think that he's supposed to be playing the safety role while Chauncey Gardner Johnson's supposed to be playing this. Mm-hmm. But with Chauncey going down, it was just like, all right, whatever, go at yeah. it. And then he They're just dominated on that Chiefs game. That Chiefs game, he yeah. went crazy. He's a he's a legitimate talent. Um, but yeah, he, he came into the league as a safety was converted after the CJ, um, whatever. Chauncey Gardner Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> put together those initials, whatever, uh, starts with a C, uh, but yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I feel like the, the lions have been most susceptible to deep and perimeter. Um, Jordan yeah. Addison is running a lot more intermediate and over the middle of the field. Um, so this is just a spot where I think the Vikings, they have to just feel like they still have a chance um, because they have not been mathematically eliminated. And if that's the case, like it just screams Justin Jefferson to me. So um, yep. I, I want to have Justin Jefferson and I lean because the matchup on the ground is poor because of the split backfield, because Sam Laporta um, is less likely to see elite volume. I still lean Amon Ross St. Brown and Jameson Williams was just ruled out while we were talking as well. Yeah. Um, so it's probably going to be a case of this is Sam Laporta and this is Amon Ross St. Brown through the air because they're probably going to have Khalif Raymond mixing in with Josh Reynolds. Um, Josh Reynolds, more of an X type possession style wide receiver. He works the middle of the field well. Um, and Khalif Raymond has the wheels. I was like praying for them to utilize him in a deep role all like for the first six weeks of the season while JMO was out. They never did. Um, they, he had like two downfield looks that in the entire first six weeks and well, they, they came in like the last two weeks of the, of his suspension, but it's just how um, it all works, man. <laughs> yeah, dude. So like that kind of removes Khalif Raymond that kind of removes Josh Reynolds for any meaningful upside. So I, I kind of just want to like mini correlate Amon Ross St. Brown and Justin Jefferson and say like, if this game turns into a shootout, it could be yeah. primarily through those two guys. Um, it's one of those like lopsided risk reward type plays, I think, that carries a lot of upside at uh, what should be rather modest ownership combined between those two. I've seen everyone's going to want to play like CD Lamb. Yeah, I've seen a decent amount go to J Jettas, but regardless, that's yeah. just uh, I, I agree with the idea of like a mini stack in this. I don't want to uh, I don't want to play the quarterbacks. I, I don't yeah. see either of these quarterbacks being GPP guys. I know that they just had pretty good weeks the last time I played. Nick Mullins threw for 400 yards. But I don't think that the Lions are going to push that pace. Like, I don't I don't think the pace of the game is going to be treated like a normal game. I feel like it, like a lot of these teams well, should what be if? less. No, no. Yeah, well, it, it does. If? It's going to have to like, go. What if Dan Campbell, game. what if Dan Campbell is just pissed off at the fucking world right now? What if like he wants to go make a statement? I don't know. And it's an NFC North. Gonna... I don't know, dude. They won the North. Know. The North is theirs. They don't need to think <laughs> about it. The They're doing a whole parade thing before the game. <laughs> uh, just, you know, you, you won the know. North, dude. Go. I mean, I don't know. We're talking about Stafford. the guy who went hope, for fourth. Dan Campbell should save all this energy for when they have to play Matt Stafford in Detroit. That's what he should do. Because when they play Matt Stafford well, in Detroit in the wild card round, that is terrifying. That's another interesting aspect of this entire week is the Rams are resting all their players. Yeah, they're still favorites by like five. I, I know, but they're still favorites against San Francisco. If the Rams lose and the Packers win, the Packers go to Detroit. Yeah. Which is, that's a softer matchup for the Lions. So I don't know. There's just, just so many the, variables. They just got whooped by the Packers though. Yeah, there's so many variables. Yeah, and that's that's an interesting point for like your best ball, playoff best ball contest and stuff is like, the Packers win this weekend. They make the playoffs and the Rams lose. The Packers have a better chance of winning 
a game than the, mm-hmm. the Rams do. <laughs> so the Rams would have to travel to Dallas and go play in Jarrah world. Like yeah. that could shake some, I don't know. It's, it's very, there's a lot of interesting dynamics at play. So my whole thing this weekend is like, what if, yeah, that's I want to, I, mean, I want to leverage those what ifs a little bit heavier than I think the field is going to. That's totally fair, but let's go forward. Let's go. You know, you mentioned Jerry world. So let's talk about the team that I think will be the chalk team of the week. Dallas Cowboys uh, against the Washington Commanders. How are you playing Dallas this weekend? This is another very interesting um, discussion to be had because this is another game where we don't know how much the Cowboys starters are going to play, but the field is likely to just think that, like the field is likely to overinvest in Dallas, whereas like not play AJ Brown or not play Amon Ross St. Brown, um, where all these offenses are like the same thing. Like, they, yes, they have a little tiny bit to play for, but like, if the Cowboys are up 30 to nothing at halftime um, and three, they score three touchdowns and kick three field goals. Like, are they going to trot out Dak Prescott and CeeDee Lamb in the second half? I don't know. Um, how likely would it be for CeeDee Lamb to score multiple of those touchdowns? I don't know. But the field is just saying like, yeah, CeeDee Lamb's good for 102 here. No doubt. I'm going to just write it in in pen. Maybe, <laughs> like maybe. But like at the same time, you have all these other spots. So I, I want to talk about this game for the other side of this discussion. Whereas like there's still uncertainty in this game, but the field is placing their bets heavier in this spot. So this is a it's a very unique situation where you can just place like leveraged bets in other spots. Um, or I mean, you could place your bet on Tony Pollard, like the. Commanders have been atrocious against the run since going shifting to a heavier emphasis on cover two. They've given up like six out of seven last weeks. They've given up RB one production. Five of those weeks, they've given up top five RB production. So no, I love Pollard. I was going to say that the way I'm playing, the way I'm playing this game is Pollard in uh, Dallas defense. Yeah. I think think that they're going to freaking, I mean, they're going to get after Howell. Like it's just how Howell was awful in that first game late on stuff, like a bunch of different, situation so it's like for me doubt pollard and howl or pollard and dallas dsd and if i don't do that i mean i'm gonna say his there's name. brian robinson if the cowboy yeah. the cowboys have been pounded by those physical running backs all season long that is their emphasis of teams like the way that they win with you know james connor um obviously we the 49ers just blitz them but like those power backs, James, even James Cook was just fucking just pounding it away. So, like for me, Washington, if it, they're gonna, if they, if this game fails, I want to bet on this game failing. It's pretty much yeah. where I'm at. Brian Robinson would be a good way to do it because nobody's gonna play Brian Robinson. He's very cheap, and it's like, yeah, he came back last week for his first week being healthy, and he had thir- he had four catches, which is just wild for me to see that. And he played 54% of the snaps and he had nine carries. Like this is a game where he's probably going to get an uptick in carries. Like, yeah, there's also like the, it's worth mentioning that like a valid outcome from this game environment is like the Cowboys are up 24, nothing at half and they don't play their starter, their regular skill position players um, in the second half. And it's like Rico Dowdle is healthy now. So what if Tony Pollard scores one of the touchdowns in the first half? What if CD scores one? What if, uh, Jake Ferguson scores one and Dak only tosses for two, 10 and two and everyone fails like that is a valid outcome as well that I think is going to be not fully explored, I think, by the field. So it's like if I'm 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 almost more inclined to completely fade this game if I am not going like Dak Prescott plus CD Lamb plus another cowboy. <laughs> so um Which is viable, too. I mean, what if they just play the whole game? So it's just leveraging those what ifs in the smartest way possible, I think, is to fully stay away or go like fully in. And I think you can do that in some interesting ways as well. That's fair. I think that I will be playing Pollard in the DST if I choose. And if not, I'm just not playing CD Lamb. And CD Lamb's in a great spot. It's not, I'm going late this weekend from uh, like, money perspective and how i'm going about things that's just the way i treat this week every year um i prepare for playoffs i try to watch the games that matter most and just get feels for what is working against these teams that are in playoff matchups like biggest game obviously is buffalo miami but like the texans colts game i'll be i'll be locked Ooh, in. Doggy. That, dude that, 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 that game 
is going to be one of the cooler chess matches of the season. Oh yeah. You have and Bobby Rise. Do you D'Amico's finally running that San Francisco? Yeah, game, man. it's so nice, dude. So nice Steichen against D'Amico, and then on the other side, you got um, Bobby Slowick against Gus Bradley. That's gonna be whoo dog. Okay, let's That's go. Gonna be fun. But anyway. moving forward, speaking of, I mentioned earlier that I was gonna play a quarterback that I absolutely loved here. Quarterback is Justin Fields. Um, they're playing right. the Green Bay Packers here, and the reason why I'm playing Justin Fields is we want to talk about motivation. Like you want to like obviously we the, these athletes are playing football. They're getting paid. They're you know going out there. They're competing. Justin Fields is playing for his job next year. Justin Fields is playing against the team that has basically been the big brother forever. Your Green Bay Packers. Yeah. Uh, Jordan Love has never lost to the Green Bay Packers. It's Matt Lafleur has never lost to the Green or to the Bears. Sorry. Yeah. Like Justin Fields is entering into a matchup where we know he's playing for his job. We know he's playing for jobs elsewhere. We know the situation of the team has been good lately. Like the Chicago Bears have been a very good football team. Their defense has been probably the best in the league since they got Phil Snow and Montez Sweat in there. And you enter into a spot against the Green Bay Packers where they've beaten them all these times. And we know Joe Barry's defense is extremely soft. Like let's uh, say it for the way it is. I think this is a game for the Bears to go into Lambeau, get a chance to eliminate the biggest rival that they have, the team that has just beaten them senseless for the last four years in a spot where Justin Fields is starting to win this fan base. This whole fan base through the Twitter that I'm on, like seeing everybody talk about it, it's, hey, Justin Fields is our guy. Like, let's just do what we did last year. Trade the number one overall pick get a DJ Moore level player and then just rock it out. It's like, come on. Like, what are we, what are we doing here? For me, I want Justin Fields in this game because I think he's going to be a willing runner. I think the red zone usage of him is going to be very high. I don't think this green Bay Packers defense is good. I think that DJ Moore, now that they've really established like that connection, it's an easy, I'm just playing him and I'm playing DJ Moore, and I'm not thinking about anything else. <laughs> And then on the Packers side of things, the Packers are really simple. They're beat to shreds everywhere on offense right now. Yeah. Their receiver position Bo is Mullen. just yeah, it's just a nightmare <laughs> to look at. Like it's like it's like who are these guys? When did yeah. they get on your team? And yeah, they're going to have opportunities, but the player that's going to have the most opportunities as long as he's healthy is Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones is in a spot for me. He went nuclear against them the first time where he pulled his hammy in Chicago. Yeah. But regardless, the biggest thing about the Bears is they're trying to prevent people throwing it down the field. That's why Flacco threw three or four picks. But then once Flacco is like, let me just hit David Njoku on a drag. And then Njoku like broke two tackles and then went for 20 yards. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, Mari Cooper on a drag. <laughs> Let's keep doing this drag thing. Yeah. This is a spot where Aaron Jones, against from a screen perspective, from just a swing pass. Like, I think he has a chance to catch eight passes in this game. Like, I think from a touch perspective, I think he's going to get like 15 carries and like eight targets, eight to 10. And Jordan Love's going to be in a standpoint of like, I can't, I don't have anybody to throw it to. <laughs> I'm going to have to just give it to my best player. And the best player on the Packers right now is Aaron Jones. And I know he's limited. I know he's been through a bunch of injuries. He's always in this weird injury uh, nonsense against the bears in week one, Aaron Jones had 11 touches and finished with 130 yards and two touchdowns. Yeah. Like I think this is a good spot for him and one that I will be, uh, attacking and it's a really ga easy game stack. You just Aaron Jones, DJ Moore, and Justin Fields. And I'm not really worried about game script with Aaron Jones. Are, are you playing this one? Or are you saying that the Packers are going to dominate because I'm a Packers fan and I hate, I hate you for having always good quarterback play, by the way. Just want to let you know that hey. the fact that Jordan Love is actually good at hey. football is really upsetting to me. Yeah. Because you just, you don't get to go through the year. I've been. Maybe it's just that we don't have an owner that to pour drinks on people. Uh, <sighs> come on. Sorry, dude. Sorry, 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 sorry. But no, it's, um... a, it's a spot where, like, <laughs> you guys are just blessed with quarterback play because Jordan Love's been good. I don't. He's been good. And your receiving core. Oh, my God. You guys absolutely destroyed the draft from just like, 
because you don't have a guy that like you're gonna have to pay a ton of money. And I think everybody knows four more it. years. Yeah, it's like <laughs> and it's like in a situation where like we're not really paying Jordan Love like that crazy. Like you guys could go into the draft this year if you end up losing and get a high enough pick, and like Romo Dunze stares at you, like you just take him. You're like, all right, well, we don't take that? we don't take offense in the first round. Oh well, yeah, I forgot. You got to keep <laughs> drafting defense for a defense that's never yeah. in the top ten. That's good. Yep. Yep. All right. Yep. Uh, no, I, I love the I love the Aaron Jones call. Um, AJ Dillon was just ruled out uh, an hour ago. Um, yeah. Aaron Jones should have the backfield largely to himself. Patrick Taylor will enter the uh, primary change of pace role, but it's going to be Aaron Jones backfield. I mean, he's consecutive weeks with 20 carries or more. Um, we talked about his how they utilized him in the first matchup. Um, and now over the course of the full season, the Chicago Bears have given up the most fantasy points to running backs through the air. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's a it's a lovely spot. I love it. There's all kinds of uncertainty with the Packers pass catchers. Christian Watson, Jaden Reed, and De- Dontavian Wicks are all questionable. Of those three, I think it's probably Jaden Reed that has the best chance of playing. Um, mm-hmm. He's had this. He's been on the injury report with a chest injury for four weeks now. Um, he ended up missing a game because of his toe injury uh, two weeks ago. Yeah. Came back a hundred or what? 80 something yard, 89 yards and two touchdowns in the first half before he took a hard hit to the chest and then missed the second half last week. Um, Jaden Reed is very, very interesting at only 5,700 in this spot against a Chicago bears defense that again, forces you to work the underneath intermediate areas behind their linebackers. So um, he's very interesting. Love the Aaron Jones call. I'm going to play devil's advocate just real quick for Chicago two weeks ago. When the Chicago Bears were playing the Arizona Cardinals, we talked about how if aliens were invading, we use that alien thing. Remember that? Yeah. Um, if aliens were invading and I had to pick a defensive coordinator to go against alien Justin Fields, it would probably be um, Gannon in Arizona. Joe Barry's kind of the same um, in that he does not blitz. He's going to play soft zone and he's going to make Justin Fields read process diagnose that's kind of his achilles heel at this point if you had like if you had one bad thing to say about justin fields it would be his ability to diagnose and make um the correct throw based on what he's seeing if you blitz justin fields you make him just go do that football shit like he's awesome um make him escape make him use the legs make him make a split second decision and then react that's where justin fields is immensely talented that's not really going to be what Joe Barry is going to do to Justin Fields this week. So um, the Packers play a ton of zone. Uh, DJ Moore has one of the highest man zone splits in the league this year. He's absolutely destroyed man coverage. Um, He's been a little bit more human um, above average, but still a little bit more human against zone. Um, That's the other side of that discussion. Um, I'm not going to like discount anything that you brought up because all those things are valid. I think it just adds to the kind of wide range of outcomes from this game. Of um, course. No, this is a this is yeah. a whole slate of just like we're, yeah, yeah we're, yeah. we're sitting here like because the one thing about the incentives thing that is always funny to me, the owners don't want them to hit their incentives. Yeah, but there's some coaches that will help. There's coaches um, in play. Yeah, those are the coaches that used to be three. They're going to help. You. Yeah, like like Dan Campbell. Harbaugh, will, like, hey, you. if you get a chance to do it, like, oh, Tom Brady was awesome with that. That's that was the yeah. easiest one to bet. It's like whoever needs their incentive, like. Wasn't yeah. it Gronk was like, hey, he I need told, one more yeah, he told Gronk told Brady. Brady went to the coach and was like, hey, Gronk needs one catch or and or a touchdown for another yeah. 500. And he's like, done. <laughs> Next and play. They just threw yeah. like a screen, like a turn. Just go turn around. Yeah, <laughs> it was like awesome. But regardless, it just depends on, you know, your flavor of uh, coaching. But do you have anything else you like to add before the Chicago wrapping it up? Nope. Damn. Let's move forward to the last game we're going to talk about. The Seattle Seahawks are traveling to Arizona. It's actually got the highest over under on the entire slate. And that's just because Arizona Cardinals do not die. We have talked about it all season where they don't care. They're just playing really hard because it seems like they actually believe in the coach. And it's really funny because during the offseason, I clowned him. Jonathan Gannon looked really weird, really stiff. (laughs) He holds it. His intro to the team was like, what are you doing, dude? Yeah, Nick Sirianni (laughs) was the exact same way. And their first season, not identical to this, but like you got Jalen Hurts late in the year to start over Wentz. And then this year, Kyler's coming off an ACL, but like then you win that big game against, I think it was the Saints with Drew Brees. 
and the Seattle Sea or the Cardinals just win their big game against the Eagles. Um, so for me, yeah, maybe the Eagles and the De- and the Cowboys already this year. It's like yeah. what? <laughs> weird. They're a weird. They're a weird brunch. They're a weird team. Um, this is a spot where I'm gonna buy into this game because Vegas is telling me to do so. And the way that I'm going to do it is by the player that was inactive in their first matchup. I, I think the Arizona Cardinals are going to play their defense, the same defense that they played when they first played the Seahawks. And they didn't play DK Metcalf. And we had Jake Bobo go for 70 yards against them. I think DK Metcalf against quarters coverage is just a dominant player. This year, he's averaging over four yards per route run with DK or G Smith back there. Um, and obviously, we know Seattle's still fighting for their wild card and different things there. So I think this is a big game for DK Metcalf in particular. And on the flip side of things, I can't take anything away from James Conner. Like that dude is just running extremely hard. I don't think I'm going to necessarily force the mini stack. He's just the one player that I'm like, I'm staring at. And I'm like, I, I I don't care your matchup anymore. You're getting used like your Nick Chubb in the same system that um, the Arizona Cardinals ran or uh, the cleveland Browns ran their yeah. offensive coordinator is now the offensive coordinator of the arizona cardinals and they're just running the ball really hard they're getting into really good spots out leverage teams um i think seattle's a little bit better on that side of the ball so james connor or trey mcbride are my two biggest interests i don't really care to go to any of the receivers um i know how priced down they are it's just one of those spots where michael wilson greg dorch are fine but they're now at prices where it's like I want them to be 3K and I want them to get 12. Like now they're 4K, 44 and 46. And I'm like, well, if they get 12, that doesn't feel that great. Like it's good. It's a good score. But this week there's like it's them versus Jordan Mason. And Jordan Mason's going to get a lot more touches than those guys are. And I know Trey McBride is inevitable and I don't care that he's 6K. This man is just going to consistently put up. I don't know how many points. I don't know if I'm going to end up getting to him, but I know if I don't play him, he's going for at least 120. So it's just a matter of how he gets there. Seattle middle of the field is pretty vulnerable to my um, experience watching them. Bobby Wagner is not the same athlete. I don't care that he was a pro bowler. He shouldn't have been. Um, And then if for whatever reason, they decide that Jamal Adams gets to play snaps, I whoever he's guarding just go to that guy <laughs> so if it's trey mcbride it's trey mcbride and dk metcalf is the smash play for me in this matchup how are you feeling about this one yeah the cardinals what they're doing on offense is is pretty cool um they're utilizing a lot of of gap concepts which is basically a, a down blocking run scheme um and what it does it's designed to generate like double teams at the at the point of attack so you're trying to create that gap by double teaming Um, they're not utilizing Trey McBride a ton as a blocker. So that means that's mostly straight up, but what they're doing is some interesting like gap concepts that include pulling guards and pulling tackles, which pulling tackles is something that has come into the league over the last one or two years. Like it hasn't been a a long time. Um, Mm -hmm. it's something that Bobby Slowick does a lot of these pulling tackles. He does utilize the tight end to create those double teams off the edge. Um, we're not necessarily seeing that with Drew Petzing, um, but we are seeing these gap concepts and James Connor is a very, very good gap runner. He is very good at diagnosing where the, where the gap is going to be in the, in the offensive line uh, or sorry, in the defensive line. And he's very, very good at reading the second layer of the linebackers. And that is translating to with his size and his, um, ability to explode through that hole has been leading to the successes that we're seeing. Um, the other interesting aspect, I love James Conner this week. The other interesting aspect is Kyler Murray, I think, um, and both quarterbacks to, to that point, Kyler Murray has always kind of, and I say always like over the last three seasons, um, after his rookie season where he was just running wild. Yeah. In the last three seasons, like Kyler Murray, when he is banged up or when he's on the injury report, it doesn't matter what it has been, his rushing production has suffered. What we've seen over the last four weeks is it's starting to come back. He has 10 red zone carries in the last four games. 
He has zero touchdowns to show for them, but that is going to come and that could come and resurface this week. I would not be surprised if Kyler Murray went for 80 yards and a touchdown, maybe two on the ground uh, in this spot. So he's very, very interesting to me this week as well. Um, His, his aerial options, man, he's still, he's, he's up against it and we see it because he is not targeting wide receivers. He's like, yeah, why would I target wide receivers when they're Greg Dortch and Rondale Moore? Um, <laughs> design me something to throw the football beyond four yards of line of scrimmage, and then I'll start targeting my wide receivers. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, um, I think the um, I think the Cardinals are very interesting. I think you can even run as much as a Kyler Murray double with James Connor because he is involved in the air and Trey McBride, and I think you can get away with that, bring it back with DK Metcalf. Um, I think you can play both running backs, primary running backs from this game, play James mm-hmm. Conner um, and Kenneth Walker. I think that is totally viable. But yeah, this game carries a lot of upside. Um, I haven't looked at ownership numbers. I don't know where the field is going to land, um, but there are some negative stigmas associated with each of these teams, so I can't imagine it getting too crazy. Uh, but yeah, I like this game a good deal, and I think you can do a lot of interesting things. Um because the because the Seahawks and the Cardinals are considered slow pace, low volume offenses, it's going to take some spark. Um, and I think the two likeliest places for that spark to come because James Conner is who he is, because um, Kenneth Walker and, and Tyler Lockett and these other guys are kind of who they are. It's probably Kyler and or DK Metcalf as the the igniting force behind this game kind of opening up. So I think those two, um, one or the other probably has to be in the lineup if you're playing players from this game. And then from there, I think you can branch out. Yeah, I don't hate the Kyler side of things. I just, again, like you said, you're, you're playing Kyler with James Connor and uh, Trey McBride. And it's like, I'll just play one of those guys with DK Metcalf and go get myself some Justin Fields. Um, I don't hate Geno Smith in this matchup. He's been one of the best quarterbacks against quarters, which is ex- the exact scheme that appears in a Cardinals run. The only thing with Geno Smith that scares me is just, I don't know which one we're going to get. Like it, there's games where it looks like he's the Jets Geno Smith. And then there's games where he looks like he has it again, but then like the touchdown production doesn't come or like they just stall out in certain spots. Um, Against Seattle or against Pittsburgh, it didn't look too great there. But when he played Dallas just three weeks ago or four weeks ago, he was phenomenal. And it always starts with DK Metcalf showing up and showing out. So DK Metcalf is the guy to have for me there. Um, But moving forward to the last part of our show, we're going to do our favorite value in our slate breaker. I'll kick it to you, Hilo. Who is your favorite value? We do this every week and I'm like caught off guard every time. Yeah, Uh, Yeah, we do um, do this every week. Favorite, <laughs> my favorite value is my probably favorite. what's that? I said my favorite value. Yeah, I'm thinking you jackass. Um, <laughs> my favorite value is probably Calvin Ridley. Um, the he could be in the slate breaker type discussion as well, but I think he qualifies as a value because that word is probably going to go largely misused this week um people are going to look at favorite value and be like we have a slew of players priced below 5k that everyone's going to try and jam in because we want to play both cd lamb and justin jefferson i kind of view that word in a different realm or i don't know what the fuck to call it um in a different light than the field is probably yeah just in a different way than the field is probably going to view it this week um a player that is underpriced for what they, the upside that they bring to the table. That's yeah. how I'll define value this week. And I think Calvin Ridley is probably one of the ultimate examples of that. Primarily because if Christian Kirk comes back, he's been priced. Everyone's going to want to jam him in. Um, if uh, everyone saw what Travis Etienne did last week uh, against, sorry, against your, your team. Um Everybody is going to flock to Evan Ingram because his recent target stre- uh, streak. It's like Calvin Ridley. This this um, this Tennessee Titans defense. They are built inside out. They struggle covering the perimeter. They struggle covering opposing wide receiver ones. They cover. They struggle covering the deep ball. And that's like that is Calvin Ridley. <laughs> so 
Um, I think Calvin is uh, one of the more underpriced players for his upside this week. I am indecisive with my favorite value. You saying Calvin makes it nowhere near as uh, easy because Calvin is a very, very good value this weekend, especially against the uh, Tennessee Titans. Again, you mentioned it. They're just bad against deep stuff. Like that's just yeah who they are. And if Trevor Lawrence does give it a go, I'm much more inclined to go there. Um, I, I personally think that the value... I, I'm going to chase the deep ball of Darius Slayton and Jalen Hyatt. Like I did it last week, every week that Tyrod Taylor drops back for quarterback. It's just so much more fun watching him do it because he just really tries to, to get it down there. And Jalen Hyatt had two 30 yard catches called back because of holdings. I, I know, was, dude, that was I was annoying. watching it and I'm sitting there. <laughs> I'm like, there's so no annoying. way, there's no way that the, and then, like Dory nice, Jackson right? decided to not tackle Puka. Tried to like just strip him for some. I don't know what the purpose was of what he was trying to accomplish there. It looked like he was trying to strip him, but we're at the sidelines. Like if you strip him, the ball is going out of bounds. And yeah. like Puka spun and just went eighty yards up the field. It's pretty uh pretty frustrating as my aspect. But my slate breaker to give you time to find yours. I is, got it. Mine's Jamar Chase. And if you try to take him, yep. no, you can't. No, nope. I Chase. love it. Um, Cleveland Browns, Jim Schwartz, they're going to play cover one, cover three. They're going to blitz. They're going to play their normal defense. Obviously, they're going to have some defensive starters out there because they have to, but they have a lot of guys uh, that they will be resting. And Jake Browning is playing for his job next year. And as long as Jamar Chase is suiting up, I think he's going to treat this game as a full go. He also doesn't like the Cleveland Browns. This game only has a 37 point over under, but they're seven point favorites in this one. So they're going to have to score points somehow. I think it starts with Jamar Chase. I think this is one of those games where like he could go absolutely nuclear because it I know it doesn't matter too much, but like his stats and stuff like he's still fighting to get a lucrative deal. He obviously yeah. will be looking to do so. And no T Higgins uh, Browns are playing backup corners. They're going to give him single eye. It's going to get ugly. And Jake Browning is going to want to feature him down the field and show like, hey, guys, someone signed me to a starting yeah, quarterback. job. I can because, throw that way. <laughs> yeah. Come back, Minnesota. Let's go. Uh, let's let's redo this one. But you pay me 20 million yeah. a year this time around. But I love who's your slate breaker. Yeah, I love that call before we get into mine. But mine, we talked about him already. It's AJ Brown. Um, the upside that he has in the spot. Um, price is the second highest price wide receiver on the slate below CD Lamb. Um, I want to pair. I one of my strategies this week is to see how many pay up wide receivers I can get in a lineup that are not named CD Lamb, um, AJ Brown, yeah. Amon Ross, St. Brown, Justin Jefferson, uh, Jamar Chase, um, Adam Thielen, Alvin Ridley, not Adam Thielen. We, <laughs> we should. Uh, we should. We should Adam both Brown. play. We should both play showdowns of each other's teams. So, like, you play the Green Bay showdown, and I'll play the Panthers showdown. Whoever scores happens. more points wins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you, you, know, you guys are actually going to score points, and and yeah. the Panthers, our Panthers aren't. Yeah, I, I, uh, I we'll just we'll just play them next week in the playoffs. All right, perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll see you there. Yeah. Oh wait. <laughs> I mean, oh, wait. At least we at least we have the number one overall pick. Yeah, 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 yeah. At least you earned that for somebody else. That's great. In your division. <laughs> God, I hate the Panthers, but that's just besides <laughs> besides the fact I, I love my team, but at the same time, it's just when you when you don't have good uh, management, you, you, it's really hard to support. And I, I don't have good management, so we we don't I don't really support as much as I should, and it's okay. I'll eventually get back once we change things, but that's gonna be difficult. Anyways, Hilo, do you have anything else that you'd like to add before we close up the slate? embrace the uncertainty smartly this week so place some bets on places where people aren't on talented situations for me my advice i go light this week that's just my personal preference i do not go heavy onto a lot of the uncertainty that hilo loves to play that is where our styles differ hilo is a game theorist i am someone that likes to know what's being done and Good luck to you guys for this upcoming weekend. We will be back next week, I believe, to break down uh, the playoffs where we'll just talk about every game because there's only six of them next week. So might as well break down the whole slate there. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Be sure to subscribe, like, and be sure to check out both of our articles that will be coming out Saturday. 
Hilo will surely have some great thoughts on how to not play CD Lamb. I will be probably telling you guys to play Justin Fields and maybe, maybe Geno Smith. We'll haven't fully got to where I am playing this weekend. See you guys. Have a good weekend.